Hey there, Clarinet playing YouTube bites. You know, in the last few videos, we've been talking about barrels, but I also promised that I would talk about the other end of the clarinet, which is the bell. Now, the bell is very important, but it's not really all that complicated in relationship to, say, to say the barrel. Um, the the bell um, controls the tuning uh, of the low E and uh, and somewhat affects the low F and the uh, clarion right hand C and it also controls the tuning of the bell B which is very very important. We'll talk about that in a second. And besides that, you know, uh, trumpet players know this much better than clarinet players but um, uh, I think relating it to the trumpet might help you understand best the, all those juicy things that trumpet players like in terms of like the res resistance to the sound and uh, uh, or the flexibility, uh, the depth, the ringing resonant quality, that has to do with the extreme ends of the trumpet, the trumpet lead pipe and the trumpet bell. The stuff in the middle is relatively kind of unromantic and uninteresting. The bore of the trumpet pretty much controls the tuning and tuning ratios and something of the resistance of the trumpet. But all that juicy stuff that causes you to love the trumpet if you're a trumpet player, you love the trumpet. Anyway, it causes you to love the trumpet. It's really tied up on the extreme ends of the trumpet. Well, the clarinet's not a lot different in that regard. The barrel and uh, the upper part of the joint here um, and the bell control a lot of the resistance balance and a lot of the flexibility and a lot of the tone color and depth of the sound as, and this upper reversing cone too. In the middle of the clarinet, it's kind of comparatively kind of dull because the central cylinder controls mostly the tuning and the tuning ratios. It's not that these extreme ends don't have an effect on it, they do, but we're talking about predominant influence. Predominant influence of tuning ratios is down here in the middle of the clarinet. So uh, the bell and the barrel are going to give you uh, certain um, improvements in flexibility, in resistance, uh, in the transitions from register to register and hand to hand uh, and they're also going to control the tuning. Uh, now the barrel, the bell, one of the, there are a couple criteria for the bell, they're very simple and uh, we need to talk about those in the next segment. Whenever you're testing bells there are two important criteria. First is that the bell should supply you a bell B, that is a middle third line B, that is well in tune. Now your low E may not be as well in tune because of the natural spread that there are in certain acoustical designs. So the low E was probably going to be a little on the low side in most clarinets, uh, but that's that's to be tolerated. The main thing is that bell B be extremely well in tune. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. The other thing is that the bell uh, has to provide a smooth uh, resistance uh, blending from say the upper throat tones from the uh, upper uh, shalomo into the lower clarion. You know uh, on many clarinets you play a uh, bell B and the B is stuffy. Well it's stuffy for for many reasons but one of those reasons is that uh, the bell is uh, is improperly designed or it's improperly aligned uh, in the clarinet itself. So if you're going to pick a bell and it's going to be a better bell than the one you have it should play at least as well in tune as the bell you have and better if possible and it should provide uh, more flexible, more resonant, and more responsive uh, uh, tones uh, on, the, on the E and B but especially to make that smooth transition when you're playing out of the throat tones and into the lower clarion. If the bell doesn't do that, I don't care what else it has, you could just throw it out of the barnyard because it's not worth it. Now there are a few tricks that you can use in testing barrels and bells. They're very simple tricks, uh, but uh, they're also very effective. Now many of you probably know some of them. Uh, like for instance, with the with the barrel, uh, if you mark it, say mark a little piece of chalk here so you can s see where you are. When you test the barrel, uh, try it in one position and then rotate it uh, 90 degrees so that the, your chalk marks over here and test it again and then rotate it another 90 degrees and test it again, rotate it another 90 degrees and test it again. You'll find that the, that the barrel will play differently in each position 
but it, it will play remarkably differently perhaps in one position better than all the rest. Now for what's the cause of that? The cause of that is that the, the barrel is not exact, the bore of the barrel is not exactly completely concentric with the bore of the of the uh, upper joint and so the way the edges overhang the, those subtle little things make a big difference in airflow in certain cases so you get a big improvement in one in one radial position and then in other radial positions the barrel may not be all that attractive uh, now you can do the same thing with bells you can uh, you know put a little chalk mark or something a little pencil mark so you know and then rotate actually you don't need that you have the you have the logo on the bell and rotate the logo in those four different places and you'll find that the bell will play much better in one position than the other. There's also another trick with the bell. Besides, uh, and you should know that because the extreme ends of the, of the, of the clarinet uh, really control a lot of the, of, of the resistance factors from left, in the left hand and right hand. So uh, when you, pull, when you uh, take the bell, the bell will not only give you the resistance of the bell B, but it'll also subtly change the resistance and flexibility, uh, decreasing or increasing it uh, in the right hand, uh, as well as affecting its own particular pitch. Um, so, strangely enough, I've found this on every clarinet I've ever played, if you take the bell, say, and just play it with the bell all the way in, push it all the way in, and then try and play the same thing with it immediately afterward. Pull the bell, say a millimeter, or a millimeter and a half, and play the same passage again. You'll find that there'll be more presence, more flexibility, and improved response by virtue of pulling the bell, and it won't really affect the tuning uh, all that much on that particular note. So that's one of the ways that you can also improve the transition uh, in the middle register from out of the throat tones and into the right hand. So those are a few tricks to help you when you're testing bells and barrels uh, so you can get the best out of the bell and barrel. You'll find that they sometimes will play remarkably better. So uh, be patient when you're testing and be thorough when you're testing. Develop those criteria and so on like we spoke about in the past video and you'll do fine. You just have to practice you have to practice testing just like you have to practice anything else, but you use your playing skills. You develop your playing skills to make them as, as objective and perfect as possible. Then you use your, your playing skills to discern the subtleties uh, and the details of, of any product to see that it's really suitable for, for your needs. In that way, as you practice, you're educating your palate just like a gourmet would ex educate his palate so when he goes in to taste excellent food, he knows what he's doing, and that's what you need to do. You, you need to be, become a gourmet when it comes to the clarinet. You don't have to, to be a master chef. It's guys like me that have to design clarinets, that we have to be master chefs. We have to know what ingredients go in. All you have to do is, is have the, the sophisticated palate to really be able to judge between a Big Mac and a first-class meal uh, from a five-star restaurant.